Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Martha Macaluso, and I'm a myofunctional therapist and co-founder at Manhattan Myofunctional Therapy, LLC. And joining us today is Mr. Patrick McKeown, who is a world leader in buteco breathing re-education and who has published various books on buteco breathing, including his latest book titled The Oxygen Advantage. Now today, we will be discussing the link between mouth breathing and ADHD. So first and foremost, I would like to begin with the definition of ADHD. So what is ADHD? Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, known as ADHD, is a brain disorder marked by an ongoing pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity, impulsivity, that interferes with functioning or development. Now, the key behaviors in ADHD are hyperactivity and impulsivity. Some can have either one, or, but most have uh, both. And although it can be normal to have some hyperactivity and inattention and impulsivity, for those suffering from ADHD, it is far greater the severity. So now let's take a look at some statistics regarding ADHD. Um, approximately 11% of children 4 to 17 years of age, so 6.4 million, have ever been diagnosed with ADHD as of 2011. The percentage of children with an ADHD diagnosis continues to increase from 7.8% in 2003 to 9.5% in 2011 and 11% in 2011. Uh, and sorry, yeah, in 2011. So now, the real question is why? Why are we seeing such increases? Why is there such an increase in ADHD? If we take a look here at ADHD versus sleep breathing disorders, the signs and symptoms, you take a look and it says hyperactivity and impulsivity for ADHD, lack of attention, fidgeting, continues into adulthood, anxiety, and including depression. And if you even take a look at the signs and symptoms of sleep breathing disorders, they're very similar. So ADHD, is linked with a variety of sleep problems. For example, one recent study found that children with ADHD had higher rates of daytime sleepiness than children without ADHD. Another study found that 50% of children with ADHD had signs of sleep disordered breathing compared to, the, to only 22% of children without ADHD. Research also suggests that restless leg syndrome and periodic leg movement syndrome are also common in children with ADHD. Now this was taken from the National Sleep Foundation. So all indicative of a possible underlying sleep breathing disorder. Children behave differently than adults when it comes to the lack of sleep. They may demonstrate signs and symptoms of ADHD because the lack of sleep can create havoc in the mental, emotional, and even physical health. So considering most of the signs and symptoms of ADHD are very similar to those of sleep breathing disorders, you know, we just believe that more studies need to be conducted. So I'm also a firm believer that whenever there's a patient who's diagnosed with ADHD, we should take a closer look at that patient and refer for a sleep study if possible, because some of the signs can be very similar to sleep breathing disorders. And just to try to um, just rule out any possible underlying sleep breathing disorders, such as sleep apnea. Now, this is a study um, that, was, uh, that indicates sleep problems as predictors and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, causal mechanisms, consequences, and treatment. So this study indicated um, predictors for ADHD such as sleep deprivation, sleep disordered breathing, and circadian rhythm disturbances. It also stated the consequences of sleep problems in ADHD patients, which included obesity, poor academic performance, and disrupted parent and or child interaction. But most importantly, it delineated the future treatment considerations for sleep problems in ADHD, which included melatonin therapy, light therapy, neurofeedback, adjustment of school start times, 
and myofunctional therapy, as myofunctional therapy is a convenient and yet efficient intervention to treating obstructive sleep apnea. So now let's take a look at another study. This was a meta-analysis on myofunctional ter therapy to treat obstructive sleep apnea, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So this study concluded that current literature demonstrates that myofunctional therapy decreases the AHI by approximately 50% in adults and 62% in children, with the lowest oxygen saturation, snoring, and sleepiness outcomes improve in adults. So myofunctional therapy can serve as an adjunct uh, treatment to uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So this is excellent news. And um, now we're going to be talking a little bit more about mouth breathing and sleep, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Patrick. Sure. Thanks very much, Marta. It's very interesting. Um, you know, I think it's a little bit scary in a way is the whole relationship and the increased incidence of ADHD is what we're seeing. So for it to affect 11% of the current population or 2011 statistics, um, one in 10 children. So what it means is that in every school class, if the class is 30 kids, there's a chance that three or four of those children will have ADHD. Mm -hmm. And having that there, it's going to affect all of how every kid is taught because, you know, a child that's fidgety or not able to pay attention is going to command more of the teacher's time and it affects every kid. And it, of course, affects teachers, it affects education and it affects parents. So I think it's really good to look at sleep. There's a huge connection there. I don't think it's just a coincidence. Mm -hmm. So if we move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at this and looking at, is there a relationship between mouth breathing, sleep, and ADHD? So here's 248 medical charts of mouth breathing children, and 58% of them were primary snorers, and 42% with obstruct, 42 had obstructive sleep apnea. So there's a significant link between our breathing and our sleep. And really the way to breathe during sleep is to breathe through the nose. And this is characterized by Dr. Christian Kimono, we're saying the only valid and correct treatment of pediatric sleep disorder breathing is restoration of continuous nose breathing during wakefulness and sleep. So when we're looking, we know from Marta's, from what you'd said there is that there is a relationship between sleep and ADHD. And now we're looking that there's a relationship between mouth breathing and sleep disorder breathing. So there's a connection then with mouth breathing and ADHD. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the next slide, Sleep disorder breathing can both result from and be worsened by nasal obstruction. And the only reason there is because nasal, nasal congestion typically causes the child to breathe through the mouth and nose or both. Um, and this is going to compromise the airway. And of course, if the, the airway is compromised, then sleep, there's an increased risk of having sleep disorders, including obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And our next paper, oral breathing. Um, mouth breathing in children may lead to the development of facial structural abnormalities associated with sleep disorder breathing. The change to mouth breathing that occurs due to chronic nasal obstruction is a common pathway for sleep disorder breathing. Now, if we look at the incidence of rhinitis in the Western population, it affects about 30%. So there's two types of rhinitis. There's seasonal rhinitis, which would be hay fever. And there's also perennial rhinitis is when there's nasal congestion for at least an hour a day and it happens most days of the year. So we're talking about 30% of the entire population in the Western world who are at an increased risk or are susceptible to having rhinitis. Um, and then we're looking at the effect that rhinitis is causing mouth breathing and mouth breathing down on sleep. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the next paper, and this is really what it's about, because if we have a child having the mouth open during the formative years, it can cause and lead to craniofacial changes. <clears throat> and the craniofacial changes that we're looking at are a more narrow facial structure, um, a very high palate, which is infringing the nasal cavity, which makes breathing through the nose more difficult then for the rest of the life. Jaws that are set back in the airways, because really we want the jaws well forward in the face, because if the jaws are forward in the face, there's plenty of room to breathe. Mm -hmm. But if the jaws are set back like mine, the airway is compromised. And if the airway is compromised, it increases the negative pressure as air is drawn into the lungs, and it increases the risk of obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. We know that 50% of children habitually and persistently mouth breathe. 
And these kids are setting themselves up for lifelong, lifelong obstructive sleep apnea. So we're looking at ADHD, but we're also asking the question, if these kids continue breathing through the mouth, will it cause craniofacial abnormalities that are setting these kids up for sleep apnea for the rest of their life? And with that then, there's reduced quality of life and increased risk of, of poorer health. Um, studies are showing the relationship between adult sleep apnea, high blood pressure, um, increased risk of stroke, increased risk of cancer. And that's maybe, you know, we can ask the question, how these kids had their faces developed correctly with good airway size? And good airway size means that flow of air is not going to be as impeded, that the resistance to breathing is going to be reduced. Mm -hmm. um, so it's vitally important that we look at mouth breathing during childhood. And if we look at the next slide, ideally this is how the face should grow. You know, if a caricature is drawing a, a, an illustration of a male, they will always have strong jaws and jaws that are well forward. Socially, it's always been recognized that strong people have strong jaws. Mm -hmm. An athlete, this is an athlete's face. In actual fact, it's taken from an athlete. It's taken from a professional soccer player. You see how forward the jaws are in the face. Mm -hmm. Good airways, wide facial structure. And a wide facial structure is created from the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth and the maxilla forming around the shape of the tongue, which is, of course, U-shaped. Um, this guy, this individual, will have good breathing. And it's likely that this individual will have good sleep because they have a good airway. Airway trumps everything. Absolutely. And if we look at our next slide. So here's tying up the whole thing. We've seen that there's a relationship between mouth breathing and sleep, and now we're looking at mouth breathing, sleep, and ADHD. So we're tying in with Marta's work. Sleep disturbances, poor school performance, and hyperactivity are all mental complications seen in many children related to their nasal allergies. It's important for the clinician to take allergic rhinitis in the child seriously to prevent or control complications that can have a detrimental effect on the child. Mm -hmm. And our next paper, children with sleep respiratory disorders, they wake up tired, they've got blocked noses, they breathe through the mouth, they tire easily, they have concentration problems, are irritated, and demonstrate hyperactivity that may resemble ADHD symptoms. Mm -hmm. I remember listening to a presentation gave by Dr. Kevin Boyd, he's a pediatric dentist from Chicago, and he's also an anthropologist. And he was talking about if we were tired as adults, and say for instance, we're driving a car, to stay awake, we wind down the window, we'll turn up the radio, and we'll move about in order to stay awake. Mm -hmm. Whereas that's what he's saying is happening with the kids, that the children are tired and in order to stay awake, they never stop. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it seems that, you know, tired fatigue in children affects it, that the behavior, how it's manifested is different than that in an adult. An adult will get tired, they'll doze off. A child with fatigue and tiredness, they can be hyperactive. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the next paper, Long-term disease leads to an exacerbation of all systemic symptoms. It results, as I said already, in cardiovascular complication. It induces developmental inhibition and cognitive dysfunction and is responsible for school and social failures and reduce life quality. You know, this is really huge because we are setting kids up. There's a very, very simple, the very, very first thing we should be doing with ADHD is, as you said, look at sleep mm -hmm. and with that get the child and teach the child the importance of breathing through the nose teach them simple exercises of how to decongest the nose breathe through the nose and switch to nasal breathing and see the changes in sleep and of course many children are going to have adenoids they may have tonsil issues and they have to be of course recognized and treated because if they're allowed to persist you know mouth breathing is going to be inevitable and sleep issues are going to be inevitable. And the other aspect of that is if a child does undergo adenoid and tonsillectomy, it's really important that they do restore nose breathing because as Christian Giemann or Dr. Christian Giemann has pointed out, if a child continues to mouth breathe after a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, if they continue to mouth breathe, there is a probability that sleep disorder breathing will come back. 
-hmm. And, you know, really we don't want that. And parents, I'm sure, don't want that. But most parents aren't aware of the negative effects of mouth breathing in children. And that's what we have to improve the awareness of. Mm -hmm. So if we look at our next slide. So sleep quality can be significantly impacted by nasal congestion. This may lead to decreased learning ability, productivity at work or school, and a reduced quality of life. So again, it's kind of re-emphasizing what was taught already in the, in the previous paper. Mm -hmm. And our next slide. Allergic rhinitis can lead to impair, impaired nocturnal sleep, and thus impairment results in daytime fatigue and somnolence, reducing both learning and work efficiency and decreasing quality of life. All parents want a decent quality of life for their child. And can you imagine that something as simple as mouth breathing can affect that? You know it does, Marty. You've worked in this industry long enough. You've read the research. I'm aware of it. I was the mouth breather when I was a kid. And there's no question, the child who's falling asleep in school, the child with poor concentration, we really need to look at their breathing. I think it's very important. Absolutely. And the next slide. So here's the relationship again. 28% of Singaporean children snored. 6% of them snored habitually. And aller allergies such as asthma, rhinitis, eczema was the strongest risk factor for habitual snoring in Singapore. So again, rhinitis, allergic rhinitis, asthma. And of course, there's a huge link between rhinitis and asthma because asthma is... is inflammation of the lungs and rhinitis is inflammation of the nose so it's a unified airway the upper airways and the lower airways are linked if there's going to be inflammation in the upper it's often likely there's inflammation in the lower so with asthma it's estimated that about 60 percent of people with asthma also have rhinitis and these guys these people are tired all of the time whether they're children or whether they're adults and our next slide children attending and this is the same paper, psychiatric services in Singapore may also have sleep disorders. The highest prevalence being in children with ADHD. So this paper puts everything in together and ties everything that we've been talking about. Our next slide. By improving children's sleep, the symptoms of ADHD are diminished and thus avoid the need to administer psychostimulants, which have undesirable side effects that produce a great deal of anxiety in the parents of these children. Mm -hmm. This is really what it's about. Mm -hmm. I, as a parent of a child, you as a parent of a child, Marta, yes. it must be very, very stressful on parents for their children to take psychostimulants. Mm -hmm. And it has to have some side effects, including, um, you know, including, for instance, the, the children's ability to concentrate, the children's ability to be in a focused state. Mm -hmm. So because if we're giving a psychostimulant to either calm down the child, what other effects is it having on that child? Would it be a more opportune question to ask, let's get these kids breathing through their noses? Absolutely. And our next, our next slide. Inattention and hyperactivity among... General pediatric patients are associated with increased daytime sleepiness, and especially in young boys. They have snoring and other symptoms of sleep disorder breathing. If sleepiness and sleep disorder breathing do influence daytime behavior, the current results suggest a major public health impact. Mm -hmm. And our next slide. Children undergoing evaluation for ADHD should be systematically assessed for sleep disturbances because treatment of sleep disorders is often associated with improved symptomatology and decreased need for stimulants. And I think this is what it's all about. This was your very first point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we look through the literature, this isn't just one or two papers. There is a lot of papers showing the relationship between sleep, between mouth breathing, sleep, and how it's affecting children and the relationship with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And our next slide. So the persistence of mouth breathing, as I spoke earlier on, so even if we do get tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy addressed, if the child continues to mouth breathe, it plays a, a role in progressive worsening of the AHI index. And the AHI index would be a sleep index. Mm -hmm. 
to measure the severity of sleep disorder breathing. And according to Dr. Christian Gimena, who co-authored this paper, it can frequently occur within three years. So a TNA is a, is a you know, it's a worthwhile um, procedure, but you know, it's not without its trauma. So for a child to undergo that, let's, let's make the most of the procedure that they've undergone. Don't just waste it by letting the child mouth breathe afterwards. Let's get them out breathing through the nose. Absolutely. And also addressing that habit of the mouth breathing because yes. with the inflamed tonsils and adenoids, that becomes habitual. So yes. we really, as you know, combining myofunctional therapy and the take breathing reeducation is critical in these yes. patients. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Because we see it, you know, if a child has had the mouth hanging open for a few years, they have really poor muscle tone. Um, so that's where myofunctional therapy is coming in to, to, you know, to reinvigorate the muscles of, of the, the face and to reposition the tongue mm -hmm. so it can direct the child. So I think it's, it's really, really worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Our next slide. So the treatment of pediatric obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing means the restoration of continuous nose breathing during wakefulness and sleep. And that's pretty much tying everything up together. Um, it's vitally important that children, and as, of course adults as well, are aware of the importance of nose breathing. But let's give our children a chance. Let's help them to have the best life that they possibly have. Don't just leave them out breathing because it is going to affect them in some way. Um, and this is where myofunctional therapy and the Buteyko method can, can offer some help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I think that's tying it in. I think that's our last slide as well. So um, <laughs> pass it over to you, Marta. All right. Thank you, Patrick. It's always, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, just getting the word out there to the parents, um, you know, of children suffering from these disorders and just showing them that, you know, there are some alternatives. There are some uh, holistic treatments like myofunctional therapy and vertical breathing reeducation that can actually make a difference um, in patients suffering from, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, ADHD, and any type of mouth uh, mouth breathing. You know, so it is uh, it's critical to be able to take this out and show it to the public and just raise awareness because I believe that it's also becoming a major public health issue. Um, with a lot of these children being um, unfortunately uh, medicated. So just getting all this information out there is, uh, you know, it, it's really going to make a difference for everyone. Sure. Thank you totally very much, right. Patrick. You Thank know, you, it's Marcia. an honor to have you with us. You too. All right.